So how many quality starting lineups can Mick Cronin actually use? Because UCLA spoiled with the riches they have for this upcoming season. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for your support. This episode is brought to you by none other than Game Time because it's time to start going to games. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. All right, where we get started today during this last day of a week two by a week, which we'll touch on later this episode is UCLA basketball. I talked about recruiting for the class of 25. Let's get to this year's team and this year's class because Mick Cronin has assembled an absolute unit, an absolute squad that will compete for a Big Ten championship, right? All the UCLA fans, we're a little skittish trying to hope we get to the football season and figure it out what life is like in the Big Ten. But then I think we're all waiting for November Come December, January, when these schools are going to learn what it's like to face UCLA when they've got a good squad in Big Ten hoops. All right. I know I think I made the comparison. Mick Cronin's trying to assemble a roster similar to two years ago. Even Bro reports in a similar thing. Mick Cronin has one of his better rosters he's had at UCLA, one of his most complete, right? His best team, Mick Cronin's best team, did not make the Final Four. His best team got ravaged by injuries and fell short of a goal where a UConn mini dynasty has been born because a dumb bone hurt his shoulder and Jalen Clark's Achilles gave out. And then a UConn dynasty was born. A UConn dynasty. And here we are, left to wonder what was two seasons ago, back in March Madness of 23, losing another crusher to Gonzaga in the last few years. But that wasn't that was Cronin's best team, a Pac-12 championship team, not a team that was one of the last teams in the tournament at large wise that went on a run in the final four. Now, Cronin has assembled a team similar in construction and has an absolute roster that overall you could I could think, I don't know what you could think, at least five or six different solid starting lineups. Legitimately, you can alternate at center. You can alternate the two. You can alternate the four. You can shift up and down the line. I've seen so many different iterations of this potential starting lineup between you look at the different UCLA reports, you look at ESPN, you look at CBS Sports, Fox, whatever you look at, whatever pundit, whatever, whatever you're listening to, they all, we all have different versions of what this lineup has. And I know you, if you go back way back when in early, early summer, late spring, when I had what, Dylan Andrews, I had Sebastian Mack, I had then Kobe Johnson, Billado, and Kyle. Everybody was mad at me that I had Sebastian Mack in there, giving a slight to both Dominic Harris and Sky Clark, Trent Perry, and Eric Freeney. So any one of those guys could legitimate start, legitimately start the two. It's solidified that Andrews will be the starting guard, starting point guard. The two could have two legitimate options, maybe three. Then you've got the three where you could have Kobe Johnson, I'm not thinking anybody's going to take his spot, but if UCLA for some reason, if Cronin finds a way to get Stefanovic in the starting lineup, I'm not sure that's how it's going to roll this year, but if they do, then you shift Johnson one way or another, and you can get Stefanovic in there. UCLA, also, what could they do? They could keep in Bilodeau. They can make him play the small ball five. They can keep him at the four. I think the four is the wisest spot for him. The five, it could be defined between anywhere from William Kyle it could be Bilodeau playing small ball. It could be Eric Daly Jr. playing small ball five. Maybe there's a world where a Diamara gets in there. I don't think that's the case as a true starter unless UCLA plays him for five minutes and then rotates with more athletic players afterwards. But then I've come up with so many permutations of this lineup that are all legitimate. That's almost a matter for Mick Cornyn not finding who the starting five is. The real question is, who is the closing five? All right, who is the closing five between the guys who can make free throws, be elite defenders, score the basketball, 
and just do what he wants in crunch time, right? That team that's equally going to hold the five-point lead and can turn around a five-point lead with two minutes. Because UCLA, when they're down seven with a minute, the staple of almost every Mick Cronin team in recent years, when they have some semblance of talent and grit and tenacity, they're down seven. Generally, that lead gets pushed to two and UCLA gets the ball back. All right? How many times have you seen this team, regardless of how much they've underwhelmed or overwhelmed over the first 39 minutes, in the last minute, it's that team that has that grit and tenacity defensive that's so crazy that they get the ball back, they have a chance to get the lead. So I look at, all right, you got Andrews, who could easily be an all-Big Ten performer this year. Then it's the debate between last year's starting guard and Sebastian Mack. Was he too hurt at the end of the year? Is he too wild to start? Sky Clark getting huge raves coming over from Louisville. This will be his third school, but he's a scorer, and he shot the ball really well at the end of the year. And the last performance he had against NC State looks better and better, considering NC State made it to a Final Four. Then you have Dominic Harris, who took all summer to get there. I wonder how quickly he'll get ingrained in the rotation. He can score. He was the third best shooter in the country from three last year, percentage-wise. In the country. And his defense still can hopefully be something Mick Cronin wants, right? So that's three guys right there. And watching the Rico's runs, Trent Perry was balling out there. Even Eric Freeney. Although I think they'll be battling for backup minutes. Maybe there's an outside chance you see Perry crack the starting five. The three, I think, is going to be held down by Kobe Johnson very clearly. Very clearly in this one, in this season. He is, what Mick Cronin says, the Jalen Clark equivalent. All right? The Jalen Clark equivalent is high praise for the National Defensive Player of the Year who was so dominant. UCLA was Pac-12 championship winning good, national championship winning good when he was in the lineup. Like, dominant. Elite dominance, similar three-point shooting stroke, can score 10 points per game. The comparisons, a little different, you know, hitch when it comes to the shooting, cool. The comparisons, they're on point. The four, Bilodeau, that's a guy who can score. you got someone behind him who can score as well. And then the five, you got three quality op- options between size, a shooter, athleticism. I think I saw on social media the what is the motto for the William Kyle family? There's no layups. You destroy the rim. So you've got a rim rocker, a unicorn, and a Swiss army knife as your three options at the five. And that doesn't even include Bilodeau. That doesn't include if for some reason Devin Williams gets in there. Oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned Brandon Williams. And I've barely mentioned last year's one one of the leading three-point shooters on the team in Stefanovic, who would do things, who could defend, he could do, he could rebound, he could score. And was the vocal leader of this team. That is how spoiled UCLA's roster is. That despite the disappointing under 500 season, some of those pieces will stir learning, still gelling, and they will be replaced and put into different roles. I think that will be favorable towards them and toward what this team needs. And if they don't accept it or they're not ready, Mick Cronin's got the next guy up who could be the two guy, who could be the one guy. That lineup will be shifting all the way around. That is how spoiled this team is, that despite the top 20, the the fringe of the top 15, UCLA, in my mind, yes, they will have a tough schedule. They'll have to travel all over. And Mick Cronin's concerns of maybe how weary they'll become NCAA tournament time might come to fruition. But there's no doubt in my mind this team will be very good. Even last year's team, before they truly figured out they were bad or just lost it, they were competing with Arizona on the road, had a huge lead. They had Marquette on the ropes. They had Gonzaga back and forth down the stretch. All right? So that was a bad team, and UCLA still away from home was doing a lot of good things before they just tumbled in December, figured it out in January, and then went down the wrong way. They declined late February. That was a bad team that still pulled off huge wins for McCronin. Now imagine with all the talents, the six transfers, the two freshmen, Dylan Andrews, who's looked looked like he's taken the next step, and a Cronin that is angry and furious as he's ever been after last year's disappointing finish, arguably his worst year team record-wise as a coach in a couple decades, right? Right. That's got to be one of his worst finishes in a long time. I'm not going strictly off the numbers, but he had one of the longest active tenure streaks getting to the NCAA tournament as a head coach. 
and UCLA broke that last year. So you got an angry Cronin, a team that wants something to prove, an energizing schedule when you go play teams that will be selling out for you on the road. With all the talent coming in from the portal for some freshmen and the returners, it's a team that is spoiled with riches this year. And I expect them to perform like it. Speaking of performance, and whether we like it or not, UCLA football is 1-0. Regardless of what I say, whatever dismal outlook we have on week one, UCLA got the win, which makes it especially painful for the second week by. So when is it time to hit a panic button? We'll talk about that and adjusting expectations for Deshaun Foster's bunch in the next segment. Whether you're hiring for your small business, you're, you're gonna when you are, you're gonna want to find quality professionals that are right for the role, which is why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. For me, I go on LinkedIn Jobs and LinkedIn. You, you scroll. They have the social side. They have the job side. You can see what people are doing, connecting, and for small businesses, it, it's not just a job board. It's where you find and hire professionals you can't find anywhere else. All right. And you might not even be looking for jobs. 70% of LinkedIn users aren't even looking for other leading jobs, right? I'm not necessarily doing that. But you don't also visit other job sites. And then next thing you know, you might find the right person, which they might be open for the perfect role. 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. All you got to do is post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Cruising on here in locked on UCLA second segment. Let's talk football team again. All right. After week one, we're all disappointed. But we're all excited because UCLA got the win. That's not what they did in the Chip Kelly era. All right, that is not what they did in the Chip Kelly era. They lost to Cincinnati at home, and they were up 10 nothing. And against Hawaii, they were down 10 nothing, looking bad, and they got the job done. So if you want to compare and contrast, UCLA got the job done. So it's not exactly time to hit the panic button. We're not hitting the panic button. All right, we're not hitting that after week one. And for us, with the second week by, we go into week three before we hit the panic button. And for me, I think there's two little spots to where we'll know a lot about this team to learn whether the panic button is for real and when there's a real chance to hit the panic button for this season, okay? We're not on the Deshaun, fire Deshaun Foster train, no, no, no. But there will be some cause of cause and concern, cause for concern in this season that it's a lost one by a certain point. This is a huge game coming up for UCLA against Indiana, all right? Once the home opener, everybody's going to be poking and prodding about the attendance. Beyond we us getting the kickoff, first, the attendance. That's something that's, you know, Deshaun Foster, I, he can't really control that at the moment. This is something he's got to build over his time as a UCLA head coach. Two, the opponent. Indiana's not the big name football program. It'll generate, you know, big market value. Basketball-wise, it's not going to do so football-wise. All right, and Indiana, I, I believe I just read a, a report about what their attendance woes have been dating back for forever in Indiana football history. So it's not like they struggled without it with it either. They haven't, they've struggled with it too. UCLA, Indiana, Indiana should be two and oh, they're trying to beat UCLA, have, I think an easy matchup in week four. And they're looking to go four and oh, and we're joking. I, I think on the locked on big 10 squad, if you watched it on the YouTube channel, that UCLA, Indiana is drumming of interest for being the worst in the big 10. I'm not sure either of these teams are the worst in the Big Ten. I still look at Northwestern. I still look, what else? I still look at Minnesota. You know, I still look at other places. And someone's got to be the worst in the Big Ten. Last year, Indiana was 3-9. and nine. They got one win in Big Ten play, but they had a lot of one-score games. So worst in the Big Ten last place could be the difference between winning some of these closer games against the games you didn't expect to win, teams you expect to beat or hope to beat, and you lose those 50-50 toss-ups. And at this point, UCLA, Indiana, Deshaun Foster versus Kurt Signetti, that is what's turning out to be closer to a toss-up than I would have liked to admit prior to the season. UCLA wins that game. They're 2-0. and 
a little bit closer to what we expected, but it depends how they improve from week one to week three, game one to game two with the bye week in between. All right? So they're not exactly learning on the fly. They're learning through practice a rough chance to get that done and then go to the next game. For UCLA, though, you lose to Indiana, you still don't hit the panic button. All right? As frustrating as it will be, it's not panic button time. And for some reason, I lose my marbles next week. And if that happens on this show, remind me, hit me in the comments. I'm going to remind you one more time that if for some reason that happens, as ugly as it might be, it is not time to hit the panic button. Overall, let alone fire Deshaun Foster. No, that's, that, I haven't seen that. But, you know, of course, that's going to go crazy whenever UCLA loses, if it is ugly. And it would have come out if UCLA lost to Hawaii. This is the wrong hire. This is the wrong hire. That's the national media. That's everybody who saw the Big Ten introductory speech by Deshaun Foster. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. It's not time to hit the panic button on the season then. Even if UCLA loses that game, loses the next three after that to LSU, Oregon, Penn State, and they're one and four, we will learn a lot more about this team when it gets to mid-October. That is the big one versus Minnesota. So the two big games, which interestingly enough, come at home this year versus the Golden Gophers and the Hoosiers, that is when we'll learn a lot about this team. 50-50 games, Minnesota lost their starting quarterback. They played a team that lost its starting quarterback for the year in the middle of their first game against North Carolina at home and missed a game-winning field goal. A coach who wanted to lead their program and regardless of whether you believe he wanted to come to UCLA and the Bruins spurned him or he said no to UCLA, we're going to learn how good this UCLA team is and how well they can fit in the Big Ten because not every year, every season is defined by playing Michigan or Ohio State because in UCLA's case, they don't play Michigan or Ohio State this year. They just don't. They play three former Pac-12 rivals turned Big Ten rivals and Penn State on this schedule. The Bruins don't even have Sparty on this schedule who in the early 2010s was battling for a playoff berth and trying to make a Rose Bowl in a national championship game appearance. That is the UCLA. That is what UCLA is trying to battle with this year. Penn State, Oregon, USC, you know, other schools. Cool? Now, they're not defined by Michigan or Ohio State. It's how do you compare against the rest and build for the future? It might not be 9 to 10 wins like we'd hope it could be, you know, at a maximum supreme variety. It's when that game comes in October 12th at the Rose Bowl, how do they look? Have they improved? Have they had the good eye test and fallen short in some of those games? As they'll be expected to lose after the Indiana game, their next three in a row. After Indiana, they will be underdogs. They will be underdogs for three weeks in a row. And depending on how overrated or underrated UCLA or Minnesota is, they might be underdogs for a fourth straight game. I just don't think they will at home versus either Indiana or Minnesota. Games I hope and think UCLA should win, but they're still very much toss-ups after their somewhat woeful performance offensively week one. That is when we learn. If UCLA is 3-3, three and three, if they're 2-4, and four, that's that's all right. It's not perfect. An ideal scenario, ideally, which I think a lot of people would take, three wins through the first six games that's on track for a bowl season still. That is beating the teams you should beat. And then hopefully with the eye test, proven they can still compete and just need pieces that Chip Kelly didn't recruit. Now, if they're looking ugly, the enemy hasn't figured out offensively. The line looks terrible. Garber's just throwing picks. They got nowhere to go. The defense declines from week one. Then by October 12th, we will know that's the panic button time. Not before then, but that would be the time to hit a, a proverbial panic button. I don't think we'll actually hit that this season. It was worrying in week one. I just hope we don't have to get to that point. October 12th, circle that date. We're either hitting the panic button on the season, only the season, not Deshaun Foster's tenure as a whole, only this season, or we're excited and ready to see how the season finishes out after that one. That is a big defining point. The Indiana game, Minnesota game. Unless they get a program-defining win, knocking off LSU on the road, knocking off Penn State on the road, beating what could be an overrated Oregon team that slipped out of the top five after their pretty pathetic performance against Idaho at home. But we'll only find out in time.
And that's why this bye week in week two sucks. And why again do they have a bye week in week two? And will it happen again next year? We'll talk about that next on Locked On UCLA. The UCLA home opener is coming up. Also, you got the big postseason coming up on one side. Games, they're, they're happening left and right. And if you want to go to them, I suggest you should. I like to get to games. Game time is where you want to be. And Game Time Picks makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to only show incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching and searching and searching. Good Lord. I search all the time for seats. I'm a, I'm a nut job. But that's how Game Time Picks can help eliminate some of that time and make it easier to find the best deals. All in pricing, where you toggle the feature on game time, you must toggle it. It shows you the pricing up front with no surprise fees at checkout. It, you have to turn it on. And you cannot be surprised by any of the fees. You're going to know what you're going to pay right away. Right away on game time. All right? So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Download game time, create an account, use the code locked on college. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E locked on college for $20 off download game time today. What time is it? It's game time. All right. Last segment for this, you know, by week awful. We're going to wait a little bit before we finally get another bye week in 2024. UCLA has two bye weeks and I wish we could have had another game for UCLA to talk about before having a bye week, but here we are. And why does UCLA have a bye week? Maybe you have that question. If you already know the answer, don't act like you know it all. We can sit here and enjoy the comparison between this year's schedule, next year's schedule, and what this means going forward, looking at the recent history and moving forward. Why does UCLA have a bye week in week two? Why do they have a bye week, two bye weeks this year, right? Since the college football season has been condensed, to fit within the windows of early December to late August slash early September Labor Day weekend, you don't get those late UCLA SC games in December anymore. UCLA is either the game before Notre Dame for UCLA, whatever, it, it don't, that last game for the Bruins is Cal. That's how it used to be. In 24, there are 14 weeks in the college football season based on when Labor Day hits in early September, meaning that Saturday before is late August. There's 14 weeks of the regular season that doesn't include week zero, that doesn't include conference championship week, doesn't include Army Navy, to get 12 games in. So built in are 12 games with two buys. Very helpful for UCLA. Very, very helpful. And funny enough, actually in 2025, UCLA and the rest of the college football world will have another 12-game and 14-week schedule so the Bruins have back-to-back -back years with two buys. Everybody in college football does. It happens every so often. Every four or five years, you mix in a leap year. It's just funny because we haven't seen one since 2019. It happened in 2019. That's the last time you, the college football world started in you know August 31st. That's when it started in August. Then, then in 2020 was when there was supposed to be another two weeks of buys. But because COVID hit, the schedules got completely reworked and were forgotten about. And if you forgot what the 2020 schedule was supposed to be, I'll remind you, just because I like to go back and say, hey, what could have been? This is what UCLA's 2020 schedule was supposed to be. New Mexico State at Hawaii, hence UCLA played at Hawaii this year. At San Diego State, UCLA played at San Diego State last year. You had a bye after the Hawaii game. Because the Hawaii game was week one this year, they had the bye week two. They had Stanford at home, Arizona at home, then Arizona State, Colorado on the road, a bye, a Thursday game against Utah at Oregon State, host Washington State, host USC, and a short week for Cal on the road in 2020. All right, maybe you cared, maybe you didn't. All right, so though that was the last time we were supposed to have two weeks of byes, and then COVID just ruined it all. So if you're wondering why you had the week two by, well, UCLA wanted to bake it into the schedule that way. One, because after Hawaii, you want your players to rest, which is why a lot of teams play Hawaii week zero, get the bye, get your game in, or you play week one, and then you get a bye after that. 
It's just unfortunate because the way things worked out, UCLA was supposed to play Fresno State earlier this year. And then they got moved to the end of the schedule, which is a spot occupied by generally USC or Cal, or in recent years, Stanford too. So those are usually the three schools that have occupied the last game on the schedule. Less so USC, more Cal and Stanford. Well, you bring in the Central Valley Bulldogs, all right, in Fresno State. They come down to town late because UCLA had to move that game. The Big Ten schedule came in and said, we want you to have that game September 14th to be a home Big Ten game that could be on CBS because of the media rights deal, get that home opener against the team that's probably not going to generate a crowd like a Michigan or Ohio State or you know a big-name team. And then you hope you put that on national television, you get those two teams in, and early in the year, that game's going to get a little bit more eyeballs than it would later in the year. Okay, That's how it worked out. The Big Ten wants to have those early season Big Ten games and make them as many, as many of them as possible on national TV. So they had to move the Fresno State game. The Bruins had to buy it out and then add on, we'll go to you in Fresno in 2032 for the first time ever. And if the Bruins are to buy that out, they'll have to pay him half a mil or something, depending on how close or far away the game is. So that is why the schedule is this way. But now let's take a look at next year's schedule. A lot of talk has been made about the buy in week two, which was kind of baked in and just unfortunate when the Hawaii game is. And then how much travel UCLA goes to Hawaii. Unfortunate. Then you got to go to LSU, right? I don't think those games were expected to be in back to back years and, you know, and back to in within the first four weeks. In addition, UCLA wasn't going to be flying to Penn State. They weren't going to fly to Rutgers in the same year. Nebraska, that wasn't supposed to be the case. Then the college football world crumbled. Yet yeah, next year, travel will be much easier, okay? And the schedule, I think, should be a little easier. All right, let's take a look. Next year, the Bruins are expected to open the 25 season. This is all on the UCLA website, by the way. Open the season in August. And when week one is in August, that means it's a 14 Saturday college football regular season and two buys are baked in. UCLA opens with Utah. Cam Rising, to my knowledge, will not get a 30th year of eligibility. Kyle Whittingham is getting closer to retirement. That might look like a very different Utah team that is very much in contention for a Big 12 championship this year, it might not look the same next year. And yes, UCLA might also be replacing, they will be replacing their quarterback, Ethan Garbers. Regardless, he's running out of time. He's running out of eligibility. He'll be the freshman or first year, fourth year QB, right? First year playing, whether it's Justin Martin or somebody else who wins the job next year or a transfer portal kid. UCLA will be hosting Utah week one at the Bros Bowl. It'll be fun. Then you go to UNLV, and UNLV has somewhat been a little different. Yes, I know their quarterback transferred out, but they're still expected to compete in the Mountain West. That game in Vegas, it won't be a lot of travel. It will be at Allegiance, right, because that's where they play their home games now, not Sam Boyd Stadium, which is where UCLA played, you know, in the early in the mid-2010s in one of those games. UCLA will play UNLV team that the moment is moving in the right direction. I just wonder what they'll look like next year. Travel, minimum. Very easy to get to Vegas. Everybody gets to Vegas. Everybody likes to play in Vegas. Then UCLA hosts New Mexico. I know New Mexico lost to Montana State, but then the next week New Mexico is also putting up quite a fight in the next game against Arizona. All right, we'll see how New Mexico looks next year, but that's a home game for the Bruins. And I think fairly manageable for the first three weeks. Zero buys from weeks one through three at the moment, although they may have to pay somebody moving to the end of the schedule. We'll find out. Also next for UCLA, the Bruins have Indiana on the road. Not terrible travel, but they return the Indiana game. East Lansing, they go to East Lansing, finally get to play Sparty. They play Northwestern, so they get to go to Evanston, right? I think they'll still have that Lakeside Stadium. I forget. It's either this year or next year. Northwestern's in the process of making a complete new stadium. I've been to that lakeside practice field turned stadium. It's beautiful. It looks even more picturesque in the small stadium they play right now. But they go to Northwestern. You hop to Chicago. You drive out. It's basically on the outskirts. Ohio State. You go to Columbus. All right. Cool, cool, cool. None of those are exactly complete cross-the-world country trips again and again, right? I mean, the furthest trip UCLA has to make has already been made. That's to Hawaii. All right? They already flew literally across the Pacific Ocean. 
And then next year, they do have to go to USC, which is a blessing in disguise because no UCLA fan ever likes to go to the Coliseum or see the ugly USC colors at the Coliseum and play on the road. No, it's not fun for a UCLA fan, except the fact that it limits travel. Next year, the Bruins are expected to have six home games. Okay, get six home games. You get Maryland, Nebraska, which will be a fun, entertaining affair. Penn State returns. Washington comes back to the Rose Bowl. Then you got Utah, New Mexico. All right, unique home schedule. I wonder what the crowds will be. Penn State will fill it up. Nebraska will do the same. Probably the Utes as well. And then you got UNLV and USC. So eight games for UCLA in 25 is not that far away in four road trips. This year, almost all the road trips are pretty far, pretty far continually. And yes, it's not the same in college football. You can hop on a charter. You get back, you're there by Saturday night, early Sunday morning, depending on the game, maybe Saturday mid-afternoon if they're given a Friday night game like UCLA will be because of the Big Ten college football contract. Says, all right, they'll play Friday games like they are this year. So the travel isn't going to be that bad. They still don't play Michigan. And then they don't get Oregon on the schedule next year, which would be funny considering Dante Moore would be aligned to start, and I'd like to see that, but that's just not the case. So travel will be at a minimum. There will be two buys to work with for UCLA, and the teams are going to, you're hopping to Chicago, you're hopping to East Lansing, Indiana, all right? Ohio State. Travel won't be as brutal in 25 as it is in 24. And we'll find out what these players say after the season, what some seniors will have to say, comparing it from Pac-12 play to Big Ten play in year one. But I also don't think it's as brutal up and down. The initial release prior to Oregon and Washington being in the conference, that involved UCLA's 24 schedule, I think, being easier. And then 25 was horrible. Now, with changing the changing of the schedule and everything, you with changing adding Utah to the schedule and Cal, UCLA's schedule is a bit easier, looks more manageable. And with two buys, trips to Columbus, Bloomington, East Lansing, and Evanston, in terms of lengthwise and travel miles, with eight games pretty much on the West Coast, that's very manageable. All right? I wonder what the 26 model will look like. But UCLA is going to keep their travel to a minimum in the non-conference and will spend as much time figuring out how to get across the country to Maryland and Rutgers and where have you in years to come. But it's fun to compare and contrast. All right? So stay tuned. This is no more bi-week material until October. All right? No more bi-week material until like October or November. I forget at this point. Week two buys, they're not the most fun. I'll be honest with you. Not fun. But we will be back on Monday to dive into what's happened in the Big Ten, dive into UCLA, Indiana, and get a little bit more excited for the rest of the conference play. Okay, Because that starts September 14th, home opener at the Rose Bowl. I hope you're there. And if you're not, stay tuned and watch on this podcast. Listen, watch, download. Thanks for your support. Get your hands up, Bruins fans. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U, C, L, A, U, C, L, A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been locked on UCLA. Zach signing off. Go Bruins.